This is by far one of the most gruesome and horrific cases I've ever worked on. These murders were frenzied. He obviously pretended he was a friend before committing these horrific crimes. Had he been anywhere else and murdered anyone else? People were quite rightly horrified. Very violent, vicious. Now consider that we have a serial killer on our hands. They had to catch him as soon as they could. This is one that I will never forget. He was in his 60s and worked as a kitchen porter um, at a really popular restaurant in the city, Darley's Restaurant, where staff there apparently called him Grandad. Claire Duffin, first on scene, crime correspondent at the Derby Telegraph. When he hadn't turned up to work, the owners of the restaurant, I understand, got in touch with his son. They went round to the flat at Waterford Drive and they couldn't get any response from him and they saw flies at the window. And they immediately called the police. Emergency. Which service? Uh, police. We're worried about a relative, John Matthews. He's not answering his door. I know the police were really concerned, then broke down the door and found him tragically in the bath. The victim's body was, was quite badly bloated. It was only later that they, they realised after a second um, post-mortem that he'd been stabbed. I'm the detective inspector running the major crime team, so I know when I get a phone call about a suspicious body that this is going to be something serious. Paul Cullum, first on scene, senior investigating officer, Derbyshire Police. The police officers that had attended on the Sunday had found Mr. Matthews' body in the bath. There was a shower curtain that was wrapped around him. We now know that he'd been stabbed. And as they arrived, there was a member uh, of the community there that had passed them. He'd been asked, do you know where Mr. Matthews is? And he said, I've not seen him for a while then went into his flat, grabbed a bag, and then left the scene. It's a 10-minute drive from St Mary's Wharf Police Station to Waterford Drive, which is just a block of four flats. I'm getting as much information as I can from our comms room. There's a man called Andrew Dawson who lives there. Andrew Dawson is a convicted murderer, and he's currently out on licence. This is our number one suspect. As I'm approaching the flats at Waterford Drive, can see that it's very much a mixed area of council flat, block, two storeys. Luke McCarr, first on scene, forensic identification unit manager. I park the car outside and I'm about to meet the team inside the scene. The block of flats is extremely quiet. The two flats upstairs, there's no reply uh, on the doors upstairs. And so I'm thinking, we, you know, where is Dawson? My colleague and I decide to force entry into Dawson's flat. As we walk in, there's just some shoes and a few bits of clothing. There's nobody there, uh, certainly no Andrew Dawson, and uh, there's no other victim of crime in that premises. The crime scene manager uh, takes me up to the landing of the property outside the door of the deceased Mr Matthews. I'm hit by the overpowering smell of bleach, which seems to have been applied in an attempt to destroy uh, forensic evidence. Mr Matthews lived on his own. He was a bachelor. The whole scene is fairly sort of sparse. There has been some attempts to actually clean up this scene. We're looking for DNA evidence, fingerprint evidence, footprints, and any fibres off of clothing, taking photographs, taking videos, so that we can piece together what's happened in the last moments of Mr Matthews' life and to try and get evidence to prove wh whoever has committed uh, this crime. There was a, a pink rose placed on the bed which obviously is uh, rather strange, but we're not sure why at this stage. 
it's quite a difficult, quite a challenging scene. We're really struggling to find any usable forensic evidence from this scene. Assessing the areas of cleanup that we can see, it appears that the multiple stabbings has probably occurred somewhere near to the hallway to the door. And then uh, there's an attempt to move the body from that part of the flat to the bath. The type of, of scene that we've encountered here at Matthew's uh, flat, it certainly is a frenzied attack. Our prime suspect is Andrew Dawson. We know that he's a convicted murderer. We suspect that he's murdered John Matthews. Uh, we've got to find him quickly. We've got to establish whether it was him or eliminate him from the investigation. My golden hour considerations here are detaining Andrew Dawson and establishing whether he's been involved in this case and identifying the other two occupants of the flats to make sure that they're safe. Derby is a city, but it's not a very big city, and there are murders, but certainly nothing like this, you know, something so grotesque and, you know, violent. People in the area w wanted to know what was going on. They were unsure and scared of what had happened, having seen such a great police presence. There was some shock that there'd been a murder. Dawson had been convicted of a murder in Ormskirk about 30 years previously. He had broken into an elderly man's uh, shop. He tied him up and uh, he'd stabbed him many times and he'd got sentenced to life in prison. We wanted to make sure that Dawson hadn't killed anybody else. Police obviously knew they were dealing with a, a really dangerous guy and they had to catch him as soon as they could. Once Dawson was identified as the suspect, it was a total team effort. A tireless inquiry was launched. John Flint, first on scene, Detective Constable, Derbyshire Constabulary. We got him on CCTV at Derby Railway Station, catching a train. We had a financial investigation team looking at where he'd used his credit cards, train tickets that he'd bought. We could trace Dawson's movement from the day he left Derby. He'd visited various shops between Sheffield and Ormskirk. At some point, he'd bought some camping equipment. He also bought some knives and some fishing equipment. And it looked to me like he was going off into the hills around Cumbria to camp out. They spent a lot of time tracking his phones and, and checking everyone who he'd been into contact with. From our intelligence systems, we identified a phone number for Andrew Dawson, and we were able to track him in almost live time, and we could see that he was moving up through the country towards the north of England. The senior investigating officer wanted us to be as close to him as we could, so his movements were being tracked. We were sending officers in the same direction. I had not long become crime correspondent at the Derby Telegraph. This was nothing like I'd reported on before, nothing of this scale and this magnitude. And this came at a time not long after another hugely high-profile case of that of Raoul Moat, who went on the run after murdering people. There was a case where somebody had camped out for a week and was giving the police a bit of a runaround, and that got a lot of media attention. And we wondered whether he was trying to emulate this, this person and been hiding from the police because he had this rucksack full of camping equipment and the knives. And there was real concern and, and fear that, you know, this was another high-profile murderer on the run. Officers had to track his every minute from when he left the crime scene on the Sunday evening. We recovered from across several counties hours and hours of CCTV, and officers had to painstakingly put that together so we could track his journey. We went to Preston and then on to Whitehaven. I uh, had no idea why he chose Whitehaven, whether he was on his way to the Lake District, whether or not he intended to hide out or try and evade arrest or disappear into the wilds of Cumbria. Local officers in Whitehaven spotted him on the bench, challenged him, he denied being who he was, but they checked his photograph. They got the man that they were after.
So as Dawson was being led away, he broke free from the arresting officers and in an effort to, to make his escape, jumped, jumped into the sea. The officers had to taser him to get him back out of the sea and into custody. Well, I think relieved, I mean, initially relieved that we'd got Dawson in custody. He was found with a, what you could be described as a killing kit, more knives, um, camping equipment. Then that relief suddenly changed to real concern that we had that four-day period between the Sunday and the Thursday where we had no idea where Andrew Dawson had been, we had no idea what he'd been doing. We could have more victims around the country. So the investigation suddenly became uh, a lot more complex. We had to interview people that he'd been to see, like his sister, uh, coach drivers, the police officers up in Whitehaven, and really piece together his whole story. Locally, people were not only like appalled and horrified about the gruesome nature of, of the murders, but also were really, really concerned and quite angry that this guy had killed before had been released. I was holding the briefing, telling everybody about the fact that Andrew Dawson's been uh, arrested and he's in custody up at Whitehaven. Within 12 hours, we had Dawson, which was a great result and, a gr and yet again, a great team effort for Derbyshire. And one of the detective sergeants is waving at me frantically from the back of the room, trying to get my attention. So I paused the briefing for a, a few moments and I went to speak to her and she told me that police officers had attended Waterford Drive. They'd forced entry to the door of another flat, which is on the first floor, and they found the body of uh, Paul Hancock in the bath. It was very, very saddened to find that uh, we'd found another, we'd had another murder. We had two victims. We had two families to be informed about this horrendous situation. The implications for us were very serious. We now consider that we have a serial killer on our hands. I'm driving my van in the middle of Derby. I'm thinking about going in for lunch. The radio goes, and I'm being asked to go to a body. The address is Waterford Drive. Joe Mallard, first on scene, crime scene investigator. We know this address has been the subject of a, a murder. There might be some relation to that first murder. There's a team working in Mr. Matthew's flat downstairs. The flat I'm being called to go to is upstairs on the first floor. I've just uh, travelled to meet with the team who are examining the scene of the murder. With the scientific support team, going to work out what the best strategy is to search the house uh, to, to make sure that we gather all the best evidence. We've got cameras, fingerprint kits, lots of packaging materials because we're anticipating quite a bit of uh, evidence to be recovered. I'm maintaining a position outside of the flat, primarily because um, what we don't want at scenes of this uh, nature is that uh, there, there might be any chance of any cross-contamination from perhaps my feet or hairs or clothing. I'm feeling tense. It's a big job. It's crucial to get the evidence from this flat to help prove what's happened in the other one. We're looking for evidence of Dawson being in the flat. First impressions are that there's not much disturbance there. There isn't any obvious blood at this stage. There may be some, but at the moment, nothing, nothing too obvious. There's a strong smell of the body from the bath because it's been there several days, and that overwhelms any smell of any cleaning that's taken place in the flat. Because of the delay uh, in this being identified as a murder scene, uh, there is great pressure in terms of now solving these murders. We're looking for evidence of Dawson having been the, the murderer. We've got some real issues, Mr Hancock. He's in the bath, and the bath is full of sludgy water. We can't get him out of the bath until we have taken every bit of evidence painstakingly 
methodically and very, very carefully. It appears that the cleaning up of the flat has been abandoned midway through. When the officers attended on the Sunday to find Mr. Matthews, we think that Dawson was upstairs murdering or having just murdered Paul Hancock. When I'm looking in the bath, there's cleaning products, a, a rubber glove that's been pulled off so it's inside out. I found the tip of a rubber glove on the carpet in the living room. Could be crucial evidence. Could be looking at fingerprints being found on that particular tip or traces of blood that we can link to either the victim or the perpetrator. We now can get Mr Hancock's body out of the bath. It is decomposing. The water in the bath is brown sludge. We've no idea what else is in there. It was difficult to ascertain exactly how injuries had occurred because of the time that the body had been in water. And bodies in water blow up and they get blistered really quite quickly. There's no room for any emotions. We have to push down any feelings. I'm joined by Soko colleagues who've come to help me with this task. I'm going to carry on taking the photographs while these poor guys have to actually physically lift the body out of the bath. A lot of the bath water will come out with him and tip over the edge. It's not an easy task. It's really messy. It's a long, long process. Bodies in water are not very nice at all. The incident room, who are trying to capture the murderer who need evidence from our scene. If we've got the offender's blood in any of the several hundred samples of blood that we're taking, then that's crucial. So they want evidence as soon as possible. Because I've been told that the offender lay down on the bed in Mr. Matthew's flat. So that information has come to me, so I'm running a crime light, a, a high-powered light, on the bedding in the bedroom. I can't see anything um, to the naked eye, so I'm packaging all of that material as well. I am thorough. I am methodical, and that's what I bring to the job, 100% concentration. This investigation has suddenly become a lot more complicated. Dawson was jailed for life for the murder of a 91-year-old shopkeeper. He, I understand that he'd broken into the shop to steal the elderly man's pension book. Um, I think he was just a teenager, 18. Dawson was released from prison uh, on licence. means his movements uh, are monitored, or should be monitored. And the licence is a home office guideline as to where he resides. Sometimes they can impose reporting restrictions. So he ended up in Derby, I understand, due to a relationship with a woman that he met here on his release from prison. That relationship broke down, and he was subsequently housed at Waterford Drive, which I understand was where single, vulnerable men were, were housed by the council. And that's where he came into contact with his two poor victims. Dawson had only been living in this block of flats for a, a few weeks. Well, it transpired very, very quickly that Dawson had befriended both Mr Matthews and Mr Hancock. And one of the lines of inquiry we embarked upon was, why did he befriend these gentlemen? As the case progressed and we started to understand a bit more about what had happened at Mr Matthews' house, what we realised was that Dawson had been in there, he'd befriended Matthews, Mr. Matthews was just an average uh, elderly gentleman. I think he liked a pint. He was quite popular. I led to believe he, he played darts and dominoes at the local pub. Dawson w w was the type of individual who would identify and ingratiate himself with single elderly 
vulnerable gentleman who lived within that flat complex. He'd perhaps been doing some washing for him or some odd jobs, and um, Dawson had taken advantage of him. He saw the vulnerability, and he preyed on that. He obviously gained their confidence, pretended he was a friend before committing these <sighs> horrific crimes, really. He didn't have much family, but it seems that, you know, his workplace was, was his family at the time. At some point, Mr Matthews said, enough is enough. I'm not doing you anymore. I'm not doing this for you. I'm not doing that for you. And that, we believe, prompted Dawson to, to, to do what he did. In the early hours of Friday morning, by later that day, we got a first account of him. And then he was interviewed over the subsequent three days about the various crime scenes that we'd got. He gave us some, you know, I wasn't there sort of type of camp. He answered questions in the first interview, and then he said no comment. At every point, uh, Dawson turned his back on the interviewing officer and refused to make eye contact with the interviewing officer. All nine interviews uh, were conducted in this fashion, which is a uh, rather strange, unusual uh, stance to take, really. We were lucky in, in, to, in a certain extent. Often in these cases, you're really pressured because of time. But because he was on licence, he was recalled to prison because of this incident. What we find in forensic science, and in particular CSIs, is that most perpetrators of crime have what we call an MO. Dr Karen Stowe, first on scene, scientific support manager. Modus operandi is born out of the fact that they've done their first crime and it's worked and therefore they carry on using the same approach each time because they believe it's going to work every single time. It's very difficult to try and understand as to what drove Dawson to this. Was he always going to do this again? Was he an individual who flew off the handle at short notice? I would consider these murders although premeditated, were, during the course of the, the crime, frenzied, given the number of stab wounds that were present on both bodies. Was it on the spur of the moment? There was obviously a little bit of planning after, to try and conceal it, but I, I don't know. I, I couldn't even begin to think as to what his motive was. I went up to Ormskirk and went to the local studies library there to find the cuts on his original case and the details of that and what he did. His first murder was also a brutal knife attack, which he later went on to use the same method when killing two other men uh, all those years later. Dawson was one of six siblings. His, his father was a foundryman and his mum was a hospital cleaner. I think that Dawson had quite a poor upbringing, but by no means impoverished from a young age was in and out of trouble with the police. I think he started sniffing glue when he was just 13 um, and then went on to cannabis and other drugs. I went up to his brother. When his brother found out what Dawson had done, he wasn't surprised at all. He said his brother was an evil psychopath, said it was only a matter of time before he killed again, said he'd always been a violent man. He came across as a loner, very deep thinking person. People came out of the woodwork to say that he, he got a violent nature and I believe he'd already assaulted one of the occupants of the flats. So there was one remaining neighbour from the four flats, Alan Cliff, and he told me how he too had been attacked by Dawson. He had his back to Dawson, and the next minute he had an arm around his neck. He felt something in his uh, ribs, and he described being attacked from behind. He feared he had a really lucky escape, and he'd managed to fight him off knowing what he was capable of, knowing that we'd had the two bodies, uh, it dawned on us that uh, this neighbour could well have been his first victim. In terms of custody time limits, which is often what puts an investigation under pressure, we were OK. Where we weren't OK was we, we didn't initially have really good evidence to convict him. We had, well, in effect, three scenes within one because we had the suspect scene, we had the first murder scene, and we had the second murder scene all in the same building. So 
in order to determine that if we did find evidence that connected both scenes with the same suspect, we couldn't be accused of transferring evidence from one scene to the other, it was absolutely imperative that we had a different team working in each of the different areas. As we worked through the case, there was actually very little forensic evidence initially, and we were really quite worried because it was obviously him. The evidence wasn't forthcoming, and we'd seized several thousand exhibits from the different crime scenes. I'm up to nearly 100 exhibits in terms of the footwear marks and the, and the blood. Recovering the taps, the U-bends, the U-bend contents, all the bedding, but a lot of it was the footwear marks and, and swabs, many, many exhibits, all of which went initially to the exhibits officer. My instruction always was to my crime scene managers to treat the scene as a worst-case scenario. If you treat it as a non-suspicious death and you don't carry out the full sequential processing and you don't follow the strategy for a murder, for example, then you're potentially losing evidence. There's been a team in Matthew's flat from a couple of days before we started on uh, Mr Hancock's flat. There's a third flat, obviously the offender's flat, Dawson's flat. And the protocol is to image the scene so that we've got photographic record of everything that's in the scene in situ before anybody else goes in there and uh, has a potential of starting to move things about. We're running out of crime scene investigators to go to any more scenes because the world is still revolving on its axis. There are still jobs coming in every day and jobs are stacking up back at the ranch. When you combine the deans, and there are hundreds and hundreds of exhibits, there has to be a forensic strategy in the incident room with the SIO to decide which ones are going to be the most valuable, which ones are going to give us um, the best evidence going forward. There wasn't anything unique to this case in terms of forensic evidence types that we hadn't encountered before, but there were various problems. Initial thoughts were that it, it was a suicide. Uh, the body was in the bath, and consequently a post-mortem was carried out to reveal that the victim had suffered some horrendous knife attack. The body tends to expand in water, so any injuries that are present will tend to um, blow up and take on a different size and shape and appearance. And it can also mask some of the tentative um, injuries. John Matthew's flat had been meticulously cleaned. It smelled of bleach, and subsequently, when we did the forensic search there, there was very little evidence that was found in that flat because the bleach in the water had destroyed DNA evidence and this sort of thing. And we had to be really clever as to how we, we search for that evidence. The very fact that you can see cleaning in the room gives us a target area to look for around that area where maybe they've missed something in that cleaning up process. We started to get snippets of forensic evidence. There were some shoe mark thing uh, that were found in Matthew's flat that, that were similar to some shoes that Dawson had had. The suspect had gone back to his flat, tried to clean the soles of his shoes, but unfortunately for him, he placed the shoes down on his floor prior to the shoes drying out. So the excess or the residue of blood and the water that was used to try and clean the sole of the shoe was deposited from the shoe onto the floor. So we had a link between the footwear marks at the two flats where the murders had occurred, but also by analysing it, the blood contained within that mark was able to be DNA profiled and linked to one of the suspects. The marks that were found in, in the flats were compared with the mark that was found within the suspect's flat, and the pattern was the same. Hancock's flat, it looked very rushed, it was very untidy, 
There was blood spatter all over the lounge. Uh, lots of clothing had been thrown into the bath with Paul Hancock. And subsequently, there was uh, a tip of a knife that had broken off that was in the bath. And there was all kinds of sort of material, jeans and shoes and anoraks and clothing that we think that uh, Dawson was wearing at the time of the murder. He was clearly forensically aware. Um, but the crime scenes were very different. One was meticulously clean and one was pretty untidy with lots of sort of blood spatter and this sort of thing. The ideal scenario for us would be looking for things like fingerprints in blood because that means that the suspect has been in that scene. Either way, they've got some questions to answer. We had a fingerprint on a bottle of cleaning fluid that was in Matthew's flat, and that was the only evidence that we could really tie Dawson into the flat. Most of the time, things that we're dealing with are, are not visible. In terms of the recovery order, we usually focus on any potential DNA first. We got from Hancock's uh, flight with some DNA in a tiny fingertip of a marigold glove that had broken off, presumably when he took the gloves off and threw them into the bath. As the case progressed, what we'd realised is that Dawson had clearly, after having murdered Matthews, he'd redressed him. We believe that he'd laid him on, the, on his bed and he'd laid next to him and he'd put a rose on the bed uh, next to Mr. Matthews. We found a note and it purported to Dawson wanting his washing back. We also found uh, a notepad in Dawson's flat. He'd written it on a notebook and then ripped it up um, and thrown it away. But he didn't realize that he'd left an indentation. We were looking to match the notepad with the note that had been left about the washing. This is the electrostatic document analyzer, otherwise known as ESTA. And it is this machine that we used to develop the indentations on the notepad that was found at Dawson's house. The way it works is that we place the item onto the surface here. We switch on the machine. What it's actually doing is it's sucking that piece of paper onto this bed to make sure that it doesn't move during the process. We put this piece of acetate over the top. What we're doing now is charging up the indentations that are present on this piece of paper by using this corona that causes an electrical charge to be deposited on the piece of paper so that when I lift this up and cascade the beads over the top, the powder on the beads is coming off and as you can see, indentations are starting to appear. And we switch this off. And what we have, when we place this onto the surface, the indentations read the Angel of Mercy. And that is a true representation of the writing that would have appeared on the page above this one. This was a, an unbelievable breakthrough. The notepad uh, was a confession and talked about the murder and talked about the rose being on a bed. This whole case is just bizarre. The fact that he was, you know, quite forensically aware and cleaned the first scene really well and went to great lengths to, to clean it and then wrote a confession letter. Which was uh, quite a sinister discovery and it read. To head of homicide, I want to confess to a murder. I stabbed a man to death a man lives in a bath of water. Two major wounds to his left side. One, maybe two, to his chest. One to his back, one to his base of his neck. This is no hoax. If you don't find him in a week, I will give you his address. The pink rose was a nice touch. Yours, the angel of mercy. Because we had Dawson very, very quickly, it was a great result. And we could use that evidence in the consequent investigation and subsequent trial. Derbyshire police seemed to have a fairly strong case. He'd obviously gone on the run. 
Um, he lived with the men. He's got previous convictions for violence and murder. They've got the letter, um, almost a signed confession. We had to make sure we, we built the case and we served all the evidence on the defence. It took about a year from when he committed the murders to him going to court. Because normally you're under a bit more time pressure. There was a wealth of forensic evidence, including indentations from the notepad that we found at the scene. There was blood analysis. There was a lot of footwear mark evidence as well. So there was a whole host of different types of forensic evidence and coupled with CCTV, which tracked where the suspect was and where he went after the, after the crime was committed. In view of the overwhelming evidence we've got against Mr. Dawson, I, I found it quite incredible that he would embark upon a not guilty plea. And the evidence of similar fact from the previous murders, and this is what helped to build the case, so we were confident. After months of painstaking work by Derbyshire police, they were ready to take Dawson to court. The case was heard at Nottingham Crown Court, which is where murders and high-profile cases from Derby go. We're expecting it to last weeks. week. There's quite a lot of evidence. There was two victims. Andrew Dawson, the whole way through the case, had pleaded not guilty, and effectively he'd made us put in an awful lot more work than you'd normally have to do if you had a, a guilty case. We were quite confident to go to court because there were numerous pieces of evidence that linked Dawson to both of those crime scenes. The more evidence we've got, the harder it is for Dawson to explain, and in particular, being able to link the confession note with the indentations on the notepad that was found within his scene was particularly problematic for him to be able to explain away. I suppose he's got nothing to lose. I suppose he would always try and give it to, in, in police terminology, give it a run uh, to see if we'd slipped up in any evidential chain or uh, technicality or anything along those lines. So the barrister will want to discredit me with the jury. He'll want to put doubt in their minds as to whether I've done things correctly and whether some of my work might not be up to scratch. He will suggest that I've put one thing in one place and something else in another. Um, if I've written ampersand on my form and AND on my exhibit label, he will suggest that I'm not methodical and so suggest that my work is slapdash and not up to scratch and I will lose my credibility with the jury if they think I haven't done things thoroughly and correctly. We attended court, it was very tense, the family were there. He arrived at court and he looked really bored. He was in a grey tracksuit, as they are, in the glass dock and just looked impassive. When it started, he, he didn't show any emotion, blank face at times. You could say he even looked bored, like he didn't want to be there. He, he didn't want to listen to the evidence against him. He had a sort of two or three hours sat in court, looking really fed up. Dawson signalled to his team, called them over to his the glass dock where he was sitting. We saw him whispering to his barrister, and the next minute his barrister stood up and said that he wanted to enter another plea. He just stared straight ahead, didn't show any emotion. And this time, when he was asked how he pleaded, he said guilty. Which meant that the trial was over. Very often, defendants will plead not guilty. Very often, once they see the overwhelming evidence against them, they do change the plea. When Dawson was on the run from police after he'd carried out his second murder, he went to visit one of his brothers in Ormscote, knocked on his door. They had a, a, a brief chat, during which time he said, I think I'm going to go away for a long time. He obviously thought he was going to go to prison again, which, which was what happened. The only thing I would give Dawson credit for he didn't put the family through a, a horrendous trial, where all this evidence would have had to be presented to the judge and jury, and the family would have 
had to listen to it. It's a good result, a guilty plea. Shows that they've, we've done our job. The, the sentencing is out of our hands. We can only hope that they get life imprisonment. It, it wasn't strategic. I mean, he, he was on licence for murder. He'd murdered two people. He was clearly going to get a life sentence. Dawson was convicted of two murders and got a whole life sentence and won't be getting parole. I have no doubt that he would have committed more murders. A full life term, which is handed down to most serious and most dangerous killers in this country, which means he won't ever be released. When the judge was sentencing Dawson, she said that uh, his victims had done nothing at all to upset him. People were quite rightly horrified by the detail, the gruesome details of the case, the fact that these two poor men had been found in their bath stabbed and, and left like that. Thankfully, Dawson is in jail and will remain there, unable to hurt or kill anyone else. Dawson <laughs> has carried out these uh, horrendous attacks, um, very violent, vicious. <sighs> it, it's difficult to say uh, what was going through his mind at the time. The sentence was, was hugely welcomed by the people of Derby. They were relieved and thankful that he was finally back behind bars and can't hurt anyone again. We've done something to help make the world a bit of a safer place, slightly safer for people, and that's why we're doing the job. This is by far one of the most gruesome and horrific cases I've ever worked on and one that I will never forget. Neither Paul Hancock or John Matthews had done anything at all to...